The real mystery does not behave mysteriously or secretively. It speaks a secret language. It adumbrates itself by a variety of images which all indicate its true nature. I'm not speaking of a secret personally guarded by someone with a content known to its possessor, but of a mystery, a matter or circumstance which is secret. Carl Gustav Jung, the father of analytical psychology, was one of the most influential psychologists of all time. Throughout his life, Jung formulated numerous groundbreaking psychological concepts that have left an indelible mark on the field. Among these are synchronicity, archetypal phenomena, the collective unconscious, psychological complexes, the personality traits of extroversion and introversion, and the process of individuation. The son of a Protestant who refused to adhere completely to any religious doctrine, Jung studied throughout his life various religious traditions, including Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Gnosticism, as well as esoteric traditions like alchemy and astrology. But what inspired Jung to dedicate his entire life to this field, and most importantly what gave birth to his profound fascination with alchemy and the esoteric arts? The answer is complex, but there is one important but overlooked hint that could solve this riddle. And this hint lies dormant in the mysterious history of Grand Lodge Alpina of Switzerland, whose second grandmaster was Carl Gustav Jung, his grandfather. Welcome to Agrippa's Diary, the gathering place for modern mystics, Carl Gustav Jung was a Swiss psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, and founder of analytical psychology, a school of psychology that focuses on the importance of the individual psyche and the quest for wholeness. Born on July 26, 1875 in Kessville, Switzerland, Jung was a pivotal figure in the evolution of psychology and had a profound impact on the fields of psychiatry, anthropology, archaeology, literature, philosophy, and religious studies. Jung was the son of a Protestant clergyman, and his early life was marked by a religious education, which would later play a significant role in his work. He was a solitary child, often retreating into his own thoughts, where he basked in introspection and deep thinking. It was the experience of creating an inner and rich world inside his creative psyche that led Jung to study medicine and eventually work as a research scientist at the Burgholzli Psychiatric Hospital in Zurich under Eugen Bleuler, a pioneer in the study of schizophrenia. While working at the hospital, Jung became acquainted with the work of Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis. Intrigued by Freud's theories, Jung began corresponding with him in 1906, and their intellectual exchange marked the beginning of a close collaboration. Freud, impressed by Jung's intellect and creativity, saw him as his successor in the psychoanalytic movement. However, their relationship soured over the years, as Jung began to develop his own theoretical framework, which diverged from Freud's emphasis on the sexual nature of the unconscious. In 1912, Jung published Symbols of Transformation, a work that marked the beginning of his break from Freudian psychoanalysis. This publication detailed Jung's evolving theories which focused on the collective unconscious, archetypes, and the process of individuation. The collective unconscious refers to the universal psychological structures shared by all humans inherited from our ancestors and passed down through generations. Archetypes are the powerful symbols and images that arise from the collective unconscious and manifest in dreams, myths, and cultural patterns. Individuation is the process of realizing one's true self by integrating the conscious and unconscious aspects of the psyche, ultimately leading to psychological wholeness. Jung's approach to psychology differed from Freud's in several key ways. He was more open to the spiritual aspects of human experience and believed that the unconscious contained not only repressed memories, but also creative and spiritual resources. Furthermore, Jung recognized the significance of symbolism and mythology, often drawing on these sources to enrich his psychological theories. In his later years, Jung conducted extensive research on Eastern religions and philosophical traditions, which greatly influenced his work on the psychology of religion. But there is a certain aspect of Jung's life that no one talks about, and that is his connection to the Freemasons, a fraternal organization that traces its origins to the local fraternities of stonemasons in the late medieval period. Just for context, Masonic teachings revolve around allegorical and symbolic lessons, drawn primarily from the tools and practices of the medieval stonemasons, as well as from biblical and classical sources. So, could Jung have been influenced by their teachings? 
The answer is complex, but the most likely answer is yes. And to prove that, we need to take a deep look at Carl Jung's ancestry. Jung's ancestry on the paternal side cannot be traced back beyond the early 18th century. The Jung family came from Mainz, and it is known that there was a Dr. Carl Jung who died there in 1645. And interestingly, in view of Carl Gustav's own later preoccupations, he was affiliated with the Rosicrucians. But the early part of the family tree comes to an abrupt end in 1688. In that year, during Louis XIV's siege of Mainz, the municipal archives took a direct hit from cannon fire and were burned to the ground, destroying all previous records of the genealogical tree. Thus, their history proper begins with Jung's great-grandfather, the physician Franz Ignaz Jung. What is known for certain is the identity and story of Jung's great inspiration, his grandfather Carl Gustav, who was born in 1794. Carl Gustav attended Heidelberg University where he studied medicine, though his first love was poetry. Upon graduation, Carl began his medical career by serving as a surgeon in the Napoleonic Wars. His bravery and skill earned him accolades, as well as a deep understanding of the human condition under extreme circumstances. Following the war, he settled in Basel, Switzerland, where he continued to practice medicine and began to make a name for himself in the local medical community. In 1815, inspired by liberal and nationalistic ideas, he converted from his family's Catholicism to Protestantism and joined the ancient Heidelberg Burschenschaft student fraternity, Teutonia. In 1824, he was granted Swiss citizenship and awarded the freedom of the city. In 1828, Jung was installed as rector of the University of Basel, a prestigious position that demonstrated his esteemed reputation in the academic world. But what a lot of people don't know about Carl Gustav is that he was also a Freemason and a venerable member of Grand Lodge Alpina of Switzerland. In fact, between 1850 and 1856, he served as the second grandmaster of the lodge. His son, Ernst Carl Jung, also served as a Grand Master of the Lodge between 1884 and 1890. So, as we can see, important members of Carl Jung's family were high-ranking Freemasons, and without a single drop of doubt, their knowledge of the Masonic initiatory practices and teachings influenced him. In fact, Carl Jung was more in touch with the masculine side of his family in his early days. Jung's mother, Emily Preiswerk, suffered from periodic bouts of depression and was occasionally hospitalized due to her condition. Her emotional instability had a profound impact on young Carl, who later described his mother as having two distinct personalities, one warm and nurturing, and the other distant and unpredictable. This is important because it strengthens the argument that Jung was influenced by the masculine role models in his family. So, was Carl Jung himself a Freemason? Sadly, we can't answer this question. The simple answer is that we simply don't know, but it is a fact that throughout his life he spent a great deal of time among them, and his work might have been influenced by their teachings. Let's take a look at some Jungian concepts to strengthen this argument even further. In his book, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, Carl Jung writes, I began to understand that the goal of psychic development is the self. There is no linear evolution. There is only a circumambulation of the self. Uniform development exists at most at the beginning. Later, everything points toward the center. This insight gave me stability, and gradually my inner peace returned. In Jungian psychology, circumambulation is the process of moving around a central point or object, both literally and metaphorically. In the context of Jung's theories, this concept is often associated with the process of individuation, where an individual strives to integrate their conscious and unconscious aspects to achieve psychological wholeness. Circumambulation, as a psychological process, involves revolving around the self, the central organizing principle of the psyche, which represents the totality of an individual's conscious and unconscious experiences. By engaging in self-exploration and self-discovery, an individual gradually integrates the various aspects of their personality, such as their ego, persona, shadow, anima slash animus, and the self. This process allows the individual to maintain a balance between opposing psychological forces and achieve a greater sense of wholeness and harmony. Jung believed that the process of circumambulation could be observed in various cultural and religious practices such as rituals, myths, and mandalas. These practices often involve symbolic representations of wholeness, unity, and the reconciliation of opposites. Jung writes, 
The union of opposites on a higher level of consciousness is not a rational thing, nor is it a matter of will. It is a process of psychic development that expresses itself in symbol. Jung saw these practices as expressions of the human psyche's natural inclination towards self-integration and the pursuit of psychological balance. And curiously enough, one of the most profound moments of the initiatory ceremony in a Masonic lodge is a certain rite known as circumambulation. The etymology of the word circumambulation can be traced back to Latin origins. It is derived from two Latin components, circum and ambulara. Circum means around or about, indicating encircling or surrounding something. Ambular is a Latin verb that means to walk or to move. In short, it is the act of circling around a sacred object. The interpretation of this ritual is typically understood as a symbolic depiction of life's great journey. We, as humans, enter the world in a state of ignorance and vulnerability, reliant on others for guidance and support. Throughout our lives, we face numerous challenges, dangers and fears. Circumambulation is often described as a representation of this experience. Although this interpretation does not conflict with facts or reason, it is likely that the ritual holds a deeper meaning. Circumambulation is an ancient and nearly universal practice. The Egyptians employed it in various religious ceremonies, such as carrying images of Isis or Osiris around temples or altars. Similar solemn rituals were conducted by the Jews, who would encircle the sacrifices, and the Arabs, who shared numerous customs with the Jews. Even today, many Brahmin sects incorporate this ritual. A priest must circle a sacred tree or pool during their initiation. Upon waking early in the morning, the priest faces the sun and walks in a circle, maintaining the center to their right. The laws of Manu dictate that in a wedding ceremony, the bride should circle the domestic hearth. For ancient Buddhists, such a ceremony held great significance, leading them to construct stone galleries around shrines for pilgrims and worshippers to circumambulate the image of Buddha. It is likely that Freemasonry has utilized the rite of circumambulation from its inception. In one of the ancient York rituals, the apprentice, demonstrating their worthiness to become a fellow, would move from one station to another, undergoing different tests by the master and the wardens. The rite of circumambulation symbolizes the process of harmoniously adapting to one's surroundings. As mentioned earlier, in Jungian psychology, circumambulation is associated with the process of individuation, where an individual strives to integrate their conscious and unconscious aspects to achieve psychological wholeness. While Freemasons use this practice in their initiatory rites, Jung described the process in a more academic way, suited for his psychological studies. But the similarities between Jungian psychology and the royal art taught in Freemasonry don't end here. Inherent in Jung's psychology is the belief that life is not simply a random biological occurrence, but rather a structured and purposeful process. Based on this, the numerous challenges we face in life, such as trauma, loss, anxiety, depression, despair, and illness, are essential, albeit difficult, components of the transformative workings of the human psyche. We often mistakenly view ourselves as victims of our symptoms and suffering. However, these personal struggles are at the core of many archetypal themes and mythological patterns. Acknowledging the mythic aspects underlying our individual experiences dissolves our self-centered claims to life's joys and sufferings, connecting us more authentically with the human experience. By focusing on the shared aspects of existence instead of the distinguishing features of personality, we liberate ourselves and those around us. In this regard, the objectives of Jungian analytical psychology and Freemasonry are similar as the communal bonds of brotherhood stem from a dedication to our collective human fate rather than the self-centered aim of refining and preserving one's personal identity. Both analytical psychology and masonry necessitate a spiritual sensitivity without being religions themselves. For many individuals, a spiritual commitment can only exist within the dogmatic framework of a religion. Jungian psychoanalysis, like masonry, is compatible with all religions because it acknowledges that existence itself is a phenomenon with spiritual aspects in which we all partake. On a similar note, analytical psychology draws from a variety of cultural and religious traditions, illustrating the same transformative process in human beings. Additionally, Jung also spent a great deal of time researching alchemy and deciphering its allegorical teachings. 
he viewed alchemy as a rich symbolic system that could be used to understand the human psyche. For Jung, alchemy is a precursor to modern psychology, offering insights into the process of individuation, the integration of the conscious and unconscious aspects of the self. Jung believed that alchemical texts and images were not merely about the physical transformation of substances, but also about the inner transformation of the human psyche. In the Red Book, one of the most fascinating works that he wrote after having experienced a direct and intense confrontation with the unconscious, Jung writes, Whoever speaks in primordial images speaks with a thousand voices. He enthralls and overpowers, while at the same time he lifts the idea he is seeking to express out of the occasional and the transitory into the realm of the ever-enduring. Jung saw alchemists as true mystics engaged in a spiritual quest, exploring the depths of the unconscious mind to achieve personal growth and self-realization. Paracelsus, a Swiss physician, alchemist, lay theologian and philosopher of the German Renaissance also beautifully highlighted this aspect when he said, The alchemical transmutation is impossible unless the alchemist himself is in the process of transformation. Jung identified several key alchemical concepts that he believed were relevant to psychological development, nigredo or blackening, albedo or whitening, and rubedo or reddening. Nigredo represents the dark, chaotic and unconscious state of the psyche. It is the starting point of the alchemical process where one becomes aware of one's inner turmoil and the need for transformation. Albedo involves the purification and clarification of the psyche. It represents the emergence of self-awareness and the recognition of unconscious content, leading to a more balanced state of being. Rubedo, the final stage symbolizes the integration of the conscious and unconscious aspects of the psyche. In the final stage, the individual achieves a sense of wholeness and self-realization, resulting in the creation of the Philosopher's Stone, which represents the ultimate goal of psychological development and the result of individuation. Jung also emphasized the importance of the union of opposites, or the conjunctio, which is a key concept in both alchemy and his own psychology. Jung writes, what takes place between light and darkness, what unites the opposites, has a share in both sides, and can be judged just as well from the left as from the right. Without our becoming any the wiser indeed, we can only open up the opposition again. Here only the symbol helps, for in accordance with its paradoxical nature, it represents the tertium, that in logic does not exist, but which in reality is the living truth. He believed that the reconciliation of opposing forces within the psyche such as masculine and feminine, rational and irrational, or conscious and unconscious, was essential for psychological growth and self-realization. Those who study the royal art of Freemasonry are familiar with these concepts, as well as vitriol, for they are a core part of the Masonic degrees, lectures, and symbolism. So, all of these facts considered, it's fair to assume that Jung was definitely aware of the allegorical and symbolical rites of Freemasonry. His work, however, takes a more academic approach which provides an open foundation for those who seek out self-realization and knowledge, which leads some to think that he was not bound to any oath, and that fact alone would exclude him from the ranks of any secretive society. But no matter your stance, one thing remains certain. Carl Jung remains one of the most important figures in the realm of psychology and mysticism, and his discoveries and theories will and already play a key role in humanity's journey toward rediscovering the truth we once knew but at some point forgotten. Now, all of this considered, I'm also interested to hear your opinion. Do you think Carl Jung's work was deeply influenced by the teaching of occult societies and his family lineage? Share your thoughts in the comments below. I am eager to hear your thoughts, fellow mystic. If you want to delve deeper into the world of ancient wisdom and esotericism, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to the channel for more insightful videos. And if you want to support my mission to unearth and decipher the forgotten teachings of the ancient mysteries and the encrypted knowledge of Western esotericism, consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Until next time, continue to seek out the light. Hen to pan.